God, I feel like I'm in a wake. <laughs> thank you, Glenn, for the kind words. I appreciate that. And thank you, Daniel, for cutting school and coming to see us. So I appreciate that. But I want to thank Ken Ford and IHMC, and I want to thank all of you for coming. I mean, I feel like such a smart guy now after sitting around and watching all the work that's being done here. I mean, my God, the, the things that they're doing here is absolutely spectacular. And what a great benefit it's going to be to the rest of the world. But um, somewhere, oh, here we go. <laughs> Need that. But I was wondering why would they invite me to come to such a, an interesting place. And then I thought, you know, Ken Ford, who got to be a very good friend of mine, he's a smart guy. And that he saw the philosophies between Patagonia and IHMC as being very common. I think uh, in their philosophy of there is no in what they're doing. They can go well outside the norm. I like it that they can seek a challenge, and with their solutions through knowledge, modeling, and representation, they can understand what I'm going to talk to you about is coming up with a new idea and how we want to have business moving into the future. What's, what's interesting is I want to talk about how the environment is linked with the economy and long-term sustainability of our business and our Earth's resources. As we all know, we're at an incredible crossroads right now as we view our global economy. We've been entangled in this old economy for the last five years especially, and we know we can't go back to that 150-year-old uh, economy, industrial economy that we've been looking at for so many years. We can't sustain ourselves anymore ecologically, financially, socially, especially with our unsustainable economic growth. We're seeing the outsourcing. We're seeing bubbles. We're seeing selfishness by financial institutions. And of course, we're living beyond our means. And as you all know, that's what created our problems back in 2008. So in the last five years, we're highlighted by very weak economic recovery. Um, you know, we're fueled by self-centered you know, political act actions out of Washington, D.C. And we know, and we've proven, that we no longer can, can continue with the government as is going along now, nor is business. So we have to start looking at a new way of what we're going to do. The American people, especially our younger generation, are demanding that we take on a very new challenging opportunity that entails reimagining our new economy. We want to make our business and our economic life more socially just, environmentally responsible, and less destructive to nature and the commons that sustain us all. So we have to look at this. It's interesting, I was at a conference not too long ago, and uh, this, this statement came up, which pretty much defines what we're talking about. So millennials, and you can read it yourself, believe that business needs to place at least equal weight on society's interest as on business interests. Business needs to stand for something its shareholder or stakeholders care about and then back it up with these values and beliefs with actions. Pretty amazing. So having realized our population, you and me, are skeptical about how we're going through our current economy, we're already seeing some influences on businesses that are starting to make these changes. Consumers, they want to feel good about spending their hard-earned dollars, and they want to spend that money with companies that are doing the right thing. We found that at Patagonia, during the down years, we still were able to have profits because people respected for what we did, and they wanted to spend their hard-earned dollars knowing that we were going to give that money back to a number of conservation issues. So again, um, what, what's going on is people don't want to be greenwashed. You know, pretty much uh, they want companies that show leadership in the products and the way they do business. Obviously, with social media, you're obviously uh, seeing any negative businesses are called out in minutes, not only through the news but on the Internet. Walmart and Nike very much saw what was going on, and they called out, thus targeting the demise of local businesses and obviously child labor in factories. There's no question that profit is going to be the mainstay of business, but more companies are looking forward to a uh, long-term sustainability, including growth and uh, managing the overuse of our dwindling resource. But we were just talking with one of the bankers here before, and it was great because we talked about Success goes beyond the bottom line, right? It includes caring for your employees, your shareholders, your customers, and your community. So that becomes the very stalwart point that we want to try to make here. So people now have to think about how their business impact the products they make, how it affects your customers, their community, and ultimately the earth. 
we're already seeing trends towards some meaningful change in both large corporate and industrial movements and innovative community-minded businesses who are prompted by these consumers that they want to take a leading role. So to give you an idea, Coca-Cola, for instance, they found that in India they were dewatering a lot of these lakes and they figured out this is not very good for our business. So what they did is they started this wastewater treatment plant, plant in India, so they recycle all their water and they can use it now for irrigation. Dow is uh, pretty amazing. You, we all remember them from making uh, napalm during the, during the Vietnam War, but now they're using alternatives for, uh, for petroleum, for a source for chemicals. But what I really like what they're doing here, is you see they're partnering with the Nature Conservancy in this five-year, $10 million partnership to assign dollar value to ecosystems. If we think of all these emerging countries, what is that going to mean to them? It's going to offer them a new way to go into business and give much better value to what they're, what they're doing with their countries. So these are pretty, pretty big movements. And then uh, Walmart, it's, it's pretty interesting that they've moved from their low price strategy, exclusive environment, and they've committed to using 100% renewable energy, they're going to create zero waste, and they're selling products that sustain our resources in their environment. Obviously, this was driven, as we talked about, by the millennials. They did a survey, and they found that 54% of their customers uh, thought they were too aggressive. 82% thought they should become better leaders. And this is a Walmart customer, which is not exactly, you know, what you, who you would think would be driving that change. But the thing that scared them most of all is 8% of their customers, that's 14 million people, don't want to shop there anymore because they've heard negative things about them. So that shows you the influence of what's going on with, uh, with, these, with these people. So uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, corpus sustainability conferences and meetings. And I was at one the other day, and all the presentations were in the forms related to innovation, which is good, of course, but they had new technologies for renewable energy, more efficient packaging, they're reducing costs in transportation, they're using less water, they're reducing toxins, they're doing a lot of other uh, recycling materials. These presentations were from high-level executives, not just your average guy, and these are from uh, you know, some of the largest global corporations of Unilever, Walmart, uh, Hewlett Packard, and Coca-Cola. But their efforts to decrease this footprint were very genuine and laudable. And a lot of them have been doing this for a number of years. But the one thing in those same years that every global indicator of the health of the planet continues to grow in the wrong direction. So our VP for Public Affairs, Rick Ridgway, he was sitting next to a gentleman from Google. And he leaned over, he goes, you know, from Patagonia's point of view, the only explanation is that our business continues to depend on annual compound growth. And that growth was overriding the incremental benefits from these new technologies. Yet no one has even mentioned it at this conference. So the Google guy just kind of nodded his head and said, you know, that's the elephant in the room. I mean, growth-based capitalism and the assumption that the growth economy equals prosperity in a healthy society is pretty much something that people are starting to question. So is there a solution? It's pretty interesting. Let's take a look at uh, Paul Ehrlich, who was a great ecologist back in the 70s. He created what they called the human footprint. So if you look at the multiple of the human population times the affluence of that population and the impact that makes up that affluence pretty much shows up what kind of impact we're having on this Earth. Like in 1960s, we're using half the Earth's resource. In 1987, uh, we're using up more than half. And now, according to the global network, or, uh, they calculate they're using 150% of our natural resources. And pretty much, you can't replace essential services such as clean water, clean air, arable land, healthy fisheries, and a stable climate. But that's not the scariest part. If you look at that affluence demand, we're growing at 2 to 3% of growth each year. Okay, and then you plug those numbers into Ehrlich's formula, and by 2050, we'll be at 300 to 500 percent beyond our planet's capacity to renew itself. It's not the sky is falling. I mean, this is what could be. But what we're looking at is you don't have to be an MBA, obviously, to figure out we're at, uh, we're at bankruptcy. So the bottom line is, why weren't any of these executives talking about this? 
uh, you know, the bottom line is they all work for large multinational public corporations. They're run by boards, required by law, to maximize profits for shareholders. And obviously, if they start to question that, they may lose their job. So pretty, pretty interesting idea. So what can we do, or what's the next step? It's kind of interesting. So Patagonia, um, I'll give you a little background on, on the owners of Patagonia. It's a privately held company. Yvonne and Melinda Chenard, who started the company, still own it. It's a $600 million company. So we've done pretty well in spite of all the mistakes we've made. If you ask Yvonne, he said, you know, I've survived in spite of myself because of all the mistakes he's made. So we pretty much have uh, take, been beaten up over the years. But, you know, for Yvonne to understand who he is and where we are and while we're taking the stance, he was one of the world's best climbers. And what happened in his day and age, for him to do the climbs they wanted to do, he had to create his own gear. So to do big climbs, they used to have all these pitons that you pound into a rock. They were very soft and malleable, and you couldn't carry enough to go up these big climbs. So he bought a book on blacksmithing, and he made the first non-malleable piton. So that allowed them to start doing these climbs. The same thing happened in ice climbing. So what happened is he made these very unique pieces in order to maintain his business. And at the same time, he knew that those pieces, if they weren't made right, people would die. So he pretty much took that same idea uh, into his clothing gear when Patagonia was formed in 1973. So it's pretty interesting. So the reason I bring that up is uh, we're very happy that because it's privately held and because these Chenards have that great passion in their heart and they can look at all this, um, you know, they pretty much uh, came up with a new way of how they felt the company should run. So if we look at our mission statement, and this was evolved over lots of mistakes and almost going out of business, but we make the best product, we cause no unnecessary harm, we use business, and this last part is very important, you business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. Sounds kind of lofty and esoteric. But however, if you look at this, uh, this last part of the mission statement came about because in 1991, we almost went out of business. As a lot of you people understand, the savings and loan crunch in 91, it had a huge impact on businesses, especially in the soft goods business like we're involved. So at that time, you could borrow money based on your preseason orders. We were growing at 50% a year. We were just rocking and rolling. So we thought we had it made. All of a sudden, boom, we got our, our line of credit cut twice. It almost put us out of business. Shards had to, had to borrow money on their house to make payroll. Pretty scary time. And the worst part was they had to lay off 20% of their workforce on the Black Wednesday. And that was an ugly, scary day. So it's pretty interesting because what we found out is we became dependent like the, like the world economy on growth we could not sustain. It's pretty simple as that. So what we did is we realized that there's a parallel between Patagonia's unsustainable push for growth and that of our whole industrial economy. Huge undertaking. So once we figured that one out, we were able to really grow and continue to be much smarter in how we did business. But now what Chenards want to do and what we want to do, we want to use the business as a vehicle for solutions to the environmental crisis. We, want, we decide we want to question the growth as the underpinning of business. The economy and by extension of capitalism is currently practiced. So essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with a different idea and put a stake in the ground and start to share these ideas. So again, you know, Yvonne, thinking about this, he goes, we at Patagonia are mandated by our mission statement to face the question of growth. But as they say, we're bringing it up and we're looking at our situation as, as a business fully ensnared in this industrial economy. I mean, it's really hard to take that introspection and look at you, but... It's something we all under, have undertaken, and it's been quite challenging, but quite, uh, quite, quite uh, interesting for sure. But this is by far the most important endeavor Patagonia has ever undertaken. Our other environmental campaigns, which are pretty much depletion of oceans, pollution of water, we have obstacles to migration paths for animals, have been about symptoms of the problem. And this is the first time we ever take a, took a look at the core of the problem pretty scary. So resources are taken at a rate and quantity that allows for replenishment. Well, here, let me put it this way. What does this responsible economy look like? 
So obviously we want to have profit. We want to stay in business. So what does that entail? We're going to have to restrain our growth. I was talking to the gentleman here who's a writer, and he worked for a big company before, and he said, you're like squeezing your customer like an orange. Where are you going to go? How far can we grow? And how fast can we grow? That becomes an interesting question. So we look at technology. It's a tool to enable sustainable living, but it's not the cure for the crisis we face. Of course, we want to make sure resources are just taken at a rate and quantity that allows for replenishment. And of course, we want to have, make sure healthy communities grow organically. And of course, unconventionally, we're, and people are not citizens. I mean, Wall Street and Madison Avenue said, you're no longer citizens, you're a consumer. And so they're pitching everything to us as you have to buy, 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 which is something we have to look at. But then again, we balance our delight, our delight for the new with respect for the durable. And I'll talk in a few minutes about what we're doing when it comes to that point in time. But the big thing I think is very difficult is we have to re-examine our relationships with ourselves. And pretty much um, we have to define what's really fulfilling for us, what really, we really need for happiness. So it's, it's a pretty daunting and even quixotic uh, idea. But I mean, we have to figure out, you know, who's happy continually buying more. You're in the rat race trying to be satisfied every day. These challenges are furthered by, by the modern economy. But however, these go way back to ancient society. If you look at Thucydides describing the Athenians 2,500 years ago, they said, these people, they're addicted to innovation. They're daring beyond their judgment. They toil on with little opportunity for enjoying it themselves. Uh, they're ever engaged in getting, and they're born into the world to take no rest for themselves and give none to others. That's pretty amazing, 2,500 years ago. Does that sound familiar? So essentially, like the Athenians, we had been taught by our parents and our peers that uh, we had to work hard, acquire, to build, and to create. But today in the 21st century is very different than the 5th century, because we're at a juncture right now where human societies have never faced anything like this before. So the question and the challenge is, therefore, we ask, how can we redirect those values to create a better economy and lead us to a better world instead of over a financial cliff? Pretty interesting question. But as we look, uh, we were looking at a book not too long ago that talked about these companies that had been in business for over 200 years. And we thought, what? nugget of knowledge, or what did they have in common that allowed them to be in business that long? And we found out there were three things, and that was quality of the product. It was innovation to create something new and something different. And again, the big thing was restrained growth. So that made a big difference. So we're not looking like a regular corporation every quarter, 10%. We've got to have that big growth. You know, that's definitely unsustainable. But coming from a background of making the very, very best life-saving products at Patagonia, you know, we applied the same philosophy to clothing. Of course, we have been innovators for years using technology. Uh, to give you an idea of what we do, Patagonia has their own fabric lab, and we have some of the foremost textile manufacturers or mines in the, in the country. So we work with mills all over the world. Uh, who understand you know, what we do, and we're looking for a new product, we're trying to create the fabric to make that product happen. We just spent three years and 50% of uh, uh, Polartex R&D budget to create a whole new line of fleeces that had much greater performance, and it was much cleaner and easier to make. So the idea is you know, we're using technology not for the sake of inventing new products, but we're replacing the old, polluting, and inefficient products with methods that are cleaner, simpler, and gave us much greater performance value. So, you know, we're, we're doing pretty well on that end. But every garment we make, which is important, and we spent 10 years doing this, we can take back everything we make and recycle it. And that was a very difficult job, and it was challenging, but, you know, that was unthinkable 10 years ago. But again, we've, we've achieved that. But however, that leaves us with a question, what are we going to do now about trying to create this concept of slow growth? What are we going to do about this elephant in the room? So for Patagonia, um, you know, we want to inspire and influence other companies, and we're going to have the population to take a look at this because we want to lead the examined life. We're questioning what Patagonia uh, can do as a company that will lead us in the next more responsible company. 
there's no question we don't have all the answers. And what we're here to do is just kind of put up this model and engage other people to try to uh, help us figure this out. We're very, very, very humbling beginning this discussion. And again, we're depending on a lot of partners and all of you to try to come up to figure out where we want to be and what we want our society to look like in the near future. After we grew so fast in the 90s and we almost went out of business, we tried an idea of not growing at all. Of course, that was a bad idea because what, what it resulted in stagnation and we didn't have products our customer needed. You know, seemed like a good idea at the time. But uh, what we found, though, is um, we need 3% to stay in business. I mean, there's no question. To be able to supply the products we need to our customers, to take care of our employees, and to take care of our environmental grant giving. So we know something has to, has to give. We know we don't need a zero-growth economy, because obviously that would create a worldwide collapse. It's just not feasible. So what are we going to do? So we're trying to come up with an economy that does not rely on, on insatiable consumerism as its growth, an economy that stops harmful practices. What we want to do is replace them with newer ideas for better practices. And there are actually some old ideas that are still good that we need to take advantage of, too. We want an economy with less duplication of consumer goods, less throw away and close your eyes to it. We're trying to take garbage out of the, uh, out of the um, landfills. So we're, what we want to do now is we want to figure out how this is going to play out. But the one thing we do know is we have to take that first step. And of course, what we're doing is uh, we want to stand up and start to uh, talk to corporations and just say, hey, you know, what's the question? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? So to give you an idea of what we're going to do here, so part of the strategies for our corporate campaign, every few years, we take on this idea that um, uh, it's something that's important in our environmental community. We go deep into discussing it. You know, we use the resource of our catalogs. Uh, catalog is probably one of our main marketing tools, and it's all in recycled paper. We send out millions of these. And if you've ever seen a Patagonia catalog, people love it because of the images. People tend not to throw them away. They collect them because they're really pretty phenomenal. Then again, with our uh, viral, with our website, our blogs, and our emails, but we have about 80 stores worldwide, and we're using them to help spread this message. So it's pretty, pretty effective uh, how we can take that first step. But the bigger things what we want to do is... Um, we're trying to invite a number of uh, uh, leading thinkers. We have like Paul Krugman, David Brooks, some very genius uh, new thinkers of how business goes to contribute. We want to inspire our customers. We want to inspire other companies by sharing stories of positive efforts by partners like the American Dream and the New Economics Institute. Of course, we've been growing, as I said, very well. We've grown 10% in the last two years. And you could justifiably say, well, you guys are hypocrites because you're growing. Well, you know, the thing is we believe in the consequences of growth and we have to start doing something different. So we need to live a simpler life and we need to consume less. We're pretty pragmatic uh, simply because we realize if we got out of bed in the morning and we stopped buying, you would create an economic collapse globally. But at the same time, if business is now practiced, how we're doing things now is leading us toward a cliff. What can we do? What changes can we make? Pretty interesting question. While no one pretends there's an easy answer, we have a lot of lead thinkers who are beginning to ponder a suite of changes that in combination could present an alternative path to that cliff. In this campaign, which we're calling the responsible economy, uh, we will examine what it takes to evolve our economy from unsustainable to sustainable and the fundamental shifts in our lives that it will require. Pretty heady stuff. We've invited essayists on topics such as redefining our relationship with stuff. I mean, what does that really mean? Our relationship with work, with food, and our relationship with nature. So the next thing we're doing is, this is pretty interesting, uh, we began this Common Threads Partnership. And we started this last year, and it was an agreement between us and our customers. We actually have people sign up for this. So as you can see, these are the different elements to reduce, repair, reuse, recycle, and reimagine. But what that means is like when we talk about reduce, we make useful gear that lasts a long time. We expect you not to buy what you don't need. We also are working with a company called Blue Sign 
And what they are is an independent company that analyzes every aspect of a product that's made. And they look at every element of you know, how the, what, what you do with the dyes, how you, what you do with the waste materials, how, what kind of uh, footprint they use to ship the different elements around the country. It's a pretty detailed program. But currently, we have 20% of our products that are pretty much in blue sign uh, approved. So we're working harder on that. When we talk about repair. I mean, we repair your gear. You pledge to fix what's broken, right? Uh, so since 2012, we've repaired 26,000 items for our folks. We talk about reuse, and this is a big one, too. Um, we've created a program called Warnware, and we found over the years, and I spend a lot of time in Jackson, Wyoming, that a lot of the kids were wearing their parents' old Patagonia clothing. As we started to look at that, we thought, you know, the stuff lasts forever. And as we started to talk to different folks, we have all these stories coming in from people who talk about how they would not give up these old Patagonia products. And so we thought, you know, this is a, this is a pretty good idea. So what we tried to do and on, on, for Black Friday, we took out a full-page ad in the New York Times. And it said, don't buy this jacket. We all, <laughs> which is people are like, what are you, nuts? You sell clothing. But underneath it, it said, if you don't need it. So we were surprised how many people took that to heart, and I had a lot of my friends who didn't buy anything new. So I thought, this is kind of odd. But uh, the idea is what they did is they ended up selling another piece to buy a piece, which I thought exactly is what we wanted to do. But uh, what's interesting, we even started a buyback program in our retail stores. So if you have a product in good condition, you can come into Seattle, Palo Alto store, Portland, or Chicago. But if you can't, be near those stores, we started a common thread storefront on eBay. We take no money from this. We just set it up with eBay, and people trade out or sell their used gear to buy new stuff, which is a pretty good start. So, uh, you know, it's been very exciting to watch this program get going. And if you look at Patagonia's website, they have a whole section on here. I was going to show you the film, but it's a half hour. <laughs> Didn't think you want to stay here all night. But uh, you know, you'll see a lot of comments from people writing in stories about their favorite piece. So it's really, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine how a film can be so good. But uh, the Malloy brothers, who are these world famous surfers who work with us, were so amazed by these people sending stories, they went out and they filmed them. So it's, if you have some time, watch it. It's a really great film. But uh, thus far, you know, we. We've uh, had 41,377 items sold on eBay already. So again, that's keeping a lot of stuff out. So again, we talk about recycle. Don't want to go past your time. Uh, we take back all your gear that's worn out. You know, you pledge to keep your stuff out of the landfill and incinerator. By recycling, we've kept up 56.6 .6 tons of worn out clothing out of the landfill since 2005. Pretty interesting. And I'll, I'll talk about this and very quickly to show you, you know, it, it's smart. You know, you're not giving business away. The Japanese company that we first started to work with, who were taking back all our polyester clothing, this, these guys were a publicly traded company. They're a billion-dollar industry. Uh, they make fabrics, but they also make medical supplies and all these different things. So when Yvonne Chouinard went over with them to launch this idea of recycling, he said, how on earth could you talk your board members and your shareholders into spending $100 million on this program? And the guy looked at him and said, well, first of all, you know, our, our, our philosophy is to do you know, the right thing, the environmental point of view. But what they found is they said, we can take back all these polyester fibers. We can, we can make new fibers out of it. So what they do is they melt it down, and they put them through a thing that looks like a shower head, and they create these new fibers and can make fabrics. So suddenly, we're not depending on the vagaries of prices of oil. We can have this almost 100% remake of all this product. So I mean, it was a genius idea because this was done well before the uh, oil boom. So again, you, know, you can see how they've been very, very successful and profitable doing the right thing. So there are some good things going on out there. So I don't mean to go on and on. So uh, then we talk about reimagine. Of course, this involves us all. We just added this to it because, again, we're here together. We want to seek a world where we, uh, we take only what the natural resource can replace. And again, our whole strength is on partnership. Our ability 
to generate change is based on partnership. So over the years, we've worked with a lot of great companies and, of course, leaders and customers to incite change in our industry and culture. Pretty difficult. Now I'm going to show you something that's really fantastic. So this is kind of an interesting quote, though, but I'll skip through this, so I'll give you a minute to read it. But again, this pretty much shows you how we can generate the change. Now, to show you a big change, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. You haven't heard much about this yet, but uh, we talked about Walmart earlier about their changes. Well, one of the things when the new CEO came in about five years ago, he was a huge fan of Chouinard and Patagonia's philosophy. So what he did is he had them come to talk to their buyers. And so Yvonne gave his speech, and the buyers were like, God, oh, this is amazing. And the CEO said, this is where we're going to go. This is what we're going to do, so let's get on with it. So a woman who buys all the pants, which are a million pair a month, something like that, she goes, you know, what can we do to start this program? He goes, you start by supporting those transitional farmers who are trying to create organic cotton in their fields and then buy organic cotton. So she goes, it's done. So for the last four years, they've been doing it, and they're one of the biggest buyers or suppliers of that. So this is the changes that they've made. But the reason I bring that up is Walmart thought, well, let's, let's take this to a different idea. Let's go out to different companies and see if they want to join us in doing this. Of course, they sent out these letters, and no one responded. <laughs> they figured out, oh, Walmart, I don't want to talk to them. But suddenly they came to Evo and said, how about if we both send the letter and see what happens? So suddenly the CEO is looking at Patagonia Walmart. What on earth could these guys ever have anything in common? So again, that was the hook. And so what they did, it was an invitation uh, to participate in the concept of coming together uh, to measure the environmental impacts of textile manufacturing. And they're using this newly standard form called the Higg Index. So again, as I talked about before, it talks about the entire supply chain. From, you know, from dyeing, from fabric making, to cutting, to transportation. Everything about it is analyzed through this. So everybody responded. And it's pretty interesting. And what happened? We have over 40 members who control over 30% of all the clothing made in the world. Think about that. Think about the change. And so you haven't seen much yet, but in the next year or two, You'll see products showing up in all these stores from Esprit and Levi's and Walmart and all these different groups. It'll have a little um, QR code on there. And so you can put your phone on there and it'll show you everything that's gone through with the production of that product. So suddenly you're starting to influence the consumer. And they're going to look at that. And these folks are going to want to buy product from that company because they're doing the right thing. And people want to feel good about spending their hard-earned dollars. So... Definitely take a good look at that. So, anyways, we move along. Um, I'm going to go here. Next thing is grants program. And, and this is kind of an interesting idea. Back in uh, 1973, when Patagonia was first starting, this little guy came up and said, hey, you know, I need some help. I need a few dollars. I'm trying to save this Ventura River. So it was like right next to Patagonia. And at the time, it was a trickle. I mean, there was nothing left. It was one very vibrant, beautiful river with huge steelhead runs coming through it. So when they started to look at that, and then at the same time, just before that, when those pitons that Yvonne Chouinard was making, he went back to his old favorite climbs, and the rocks were getting destroyed from pounding these pitons in and taking them out. So those were very big moments in his life of what he wanted to do. So he said, okay, we're making money off the resource, so we're going to have our earth tax. So we're donating 10% of our profits back to environmental causes. So essentially, you know, there's, there's places all over the country that, you know, you have threats to rivers and resources and forests and oceans. So we decided at that time to focus our grant giving to those organizations. And we thought about that because at the time, you can't depend on the government to get that done. It's not happening. And I'll talk about what we're doing the government in a minute. But, uh, and we started to think, you know, our government wasn't formed by a party. It was formed by a bunch of guys dressed as Indian, Indians throwing tea in the harbor. So it's the people who are making things happen. So we want to support those grassroots groups because collectively they're going to save a lot of the resources we really need to take a look at. Okay? So um, what we have here is um, we took this idea a little further. About six years ago, we created what's called 1% for the planet. 
So what we did is we found like-minded businesses who really had a great passion for supporting their, their environment, their resources. So what they've done is um, what, if a guy joins this, he can write the checks directly to the groups that matter most to him. Like there's a restaurant in the Eastern Shore of Maryland. He said, I want my money to go right in the Chesapeake. I want my customers to look at that and know we're trying to do something and raise that awareness. Uh, New Belgium Brewing, another great company that really committed to making this thing happen. So, I mean, there's some really positive things about this. But as a result, 1,200 like-minded companies from 48 countries donating 1% for the revenues to 3,300 nonprofits. There's a number of play in Florida, a number of organizations that we're underwriting as well as these people are. So it's a pretty good program. 100 million bucks so far. That does a lot. It does a lot. But the big thing is you're creating long-term funding to support these grassroots groups that affect your communities. So what you have to look at is I'm not giving money away. Me as a company, what I'm doing, it's a marketing expense. So if I have, like for Patagonia or I tell other people, if you have reps or you're selling at regions around the country, if you suddenly start donating money to a cause that's very much important to that community, they're going to want to do business with you. So, I mean, this is why you need to think a little more uh, beyond that. So this is a pretty heady thing, and we're pretty excited about this. So anyway, I'll kind of come through here. Uh, so you're well aware, of course, all the threats that are going on here in Florida. And we've donated a lot of money to Bonefish and Tarpon Trust and the and Coastal Conservation Association, Everglades Foundation. These are all very, very important companies. Uh, important areas. But again, when we start looking at that, and as we look at the challenges we have from population, water issues, that type of thing, what's Florida going to look like? And we're looking at this in all places. If we start to change the things that people come here for to enjoy, if your fishing starts to change, or if your recreation starts to change, if you can't go in the water, the oil spill in the Gulf you know, was pretty threatening, and you're blown away by what that could have done to our resource. So again, these are things we need to start to look at and what can do, you do as a company to make this, make this a little better. So uh, anyway, uh, you know, our hope is together we can start taking on this new idea, this new thinking. And that's what it's going to take. It's going to take us all here. We want to find a balance to protect the planet and our resources. And we all want to continue to be in business uh, in the next 200 years. We want to ensure that our children and our children's children know that we're thinking about them and we didn't fail them uh, on our watch. That's very important. And my friend Tom Brokaw, he's an interesting guy and Ken will appreciate the story, that uh, he was interviewing Alan Shepard on the 20th anniversary of his space flight. And Alan Shepard said he was sitting there and he's in the capsule looking out the window and looking down at the earth. And he kind of held his thumb up and it covered the earth. And at that moment, he's like, God, you know, this earth is so fragile. He goes, we're, we're, I can't believe, you know, what I'm seeing here. And as he got back, he goes, you know, the future's in our hands. And so we know that the future's in our hands. And it's up to us right now to kind of get together, um, you know, for IHMC with all your creative prowess, with the communities here, the universities' communities, you know, with the professors, the students, we're all in this together. We want to become partners in educating people about this and trying to figure out what we can do. So you'll see more about this, and it's, it's, it's daunting, it's scary, uh, but it's at the same time very exciting. So thank you for your time, and if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Ah, there we go. I'm interested in the outcomes of the effort, and I want to know what happened to the Ventura River. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. They, um, they took out a dam and the river. There's a good flow of water coming through, and steelhead have come back. It's not back to where it should be, but uh, we still continue to fight the battle, and uh, they're trying to do developments up high above the... Uh, at the top of the river and continue to take away. But there's enough momentum going with the, with the county of Ventura and uh, enough people battling to support that. But it's so exciting to see water flowing in there and seeing steelhead come back. So thanks for asking. That's, yes, sir? I'd like to know how this could uh, potentially affect the... Can you wait for the microphone, please? 
Yeah, and that's a, that's a very good question. If you didn't hear him, he's asking about how that could affect the balance of trade for other countries. You know, it's hard to say at this point in time because it's so early in this campaign. And ideally, what we're trying to do is involve as many people as we can. So we have offices in France and offices in Germany and Italy and Japan and all these different countries. So as we undertake this, we're trying to get thinkers from those countries and try to see what we're going to do. You know, you look at Germany and, and Scandinavia, these guys love this idea. They're very much behind it. But this is not an easy solution. And of course, we're just beginning to look at it. But ideally, you're, you know, we're going to have to see how that pans out. I think, you know, what we're seeing is going to be very beneficial to emerging countries. But uh, for traditional trade partners, we have to see how that's going to play out. But that's another really good question. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. It seems that you're looking at a mindset cultural change. Yes. And we're a lot of old dogs that are hard to teach mm -hmm. new tricks to. <laughs> so what's the approach to get younger generations really behind this? Because they're the future, and they're the ones who are going to be the consumers. Well, the older people are smart already because they're consuming less, right? I mean, if you're retired, you're doing it. Young people are actually driving a lot of this. Um, you know, there's so much stuff thrown at them from TV and from, you know, on the Internet and all these different things. As we build these stories, we try to reach these young people. We're trying to get them to better understand what's going on here. And, you know, I know with my own son, it's just like, okay, you know, what do we really need? And so he's actually very good about it, saying, you got too much junk, get rid of it. So, uh, you know, it's a small start, but again, as we build these stories and we launch this campaign and we get better partners, you know, we're going to really relate well to these kids. We did a program called Vote the Environment when the election was on. So we brought together all these young surfers and skiing stars and some of these great ambassadors, and they were talking about, we're going to vote the environment. It really matters to us. So through different stories, we can engage these folks and begin to change that cultural shift. Because it is big and it's daunting trying to change how we, how we traditionally do things. As I said, we've been taught so many years of how to do things. But the kids, they're getting in school, and they're getting it from their friends, and you're starting to see a shift in their minds, and we're seeing how they're driving changes in business already. So hopefully we can, we can keep, keep them very much in the loop because that's who we're focusing on. That's the future. We're partway there, so that's a good thing. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. We manufacture apparel all over the world. Uh, we, U.S., we do it in, uh, in uh, Panama, Portugal, China, Thailand. I mean, we do it a lot of different places. It's interesting because when, uh, when China, it's it very fascinating because they went to all the, for clothing, they went to every major high-tech apparel manufacturing company. They brought them in for free. They helped them build factories. I mean, they really wanted to have these folks come in and do that business. So some of the pro products we make are extraordinarily technically challenging, especially a lot of our shells, waders, things like that. And there's like, you know, about 103 pieces to put together. And when you have taping and all these sophisticated pieces, you can't go to just any factory. So again, they set these up and the factories we're doing business with for many years started to move there, and so we kind of moved that production around. But, you know, China is always a challenge, and that's kind of a, a thing of what we're going to do. And it's interesting because what's driving China, it used to be low cost, but now with so many companies moving into China, they're trying to hire the already skilled labor. And as a result, you know, the prices keep going up on, on costs of products. But what's interesting is we were involved in um, the President's Commission and with, with China to help evaluate factories and to show them how they should build their factories to keep, uh, to take care of their employees and how they should build things up. And there's so much work to be done over there. I mean, we hate to support another country, but uh, we are. And what's interesting is we tried for years, when I first started at Patagonia 25 years ago, we kept trying to go to different factories in the U.S. and they can't make the stuff we asked them to make because it's very technically challenging, and we have a lot of details to it. And unfortunately, Walmart and Kmart and people like that were trying to drive prices down, and they dumbed down these factories. And so what happened is these guys made stuff fast and cheap with not much quality to it, and as a result, 
they all went out of business. And that's, that's a big challenge. There are some good companies now that are, and we use them in the U.S., who are doing some good work. And, uh, you know, the cost is not too far off. But again, a lot of these technical pieces, we have to move around to different parts Last of the world. Last question, please. Looking off into the future, the uh, experts on population growth say in the year 2035, uh, demand is going to exceed supply, and all kind of problems are going to develop. Uh, with this geometric progression of our population growth in the world, has any thought been given to it by your company? Oh, well, I mean, that's why we're starting what we are now. I mean, what, what can we do? to try to manage that growth. I mean, you just summar summarized everything I was saying. I mean, we have to start looking now at this big bubble coming our way. And um, there's no question about what we, we have to do it. And, you know, we we're always thinking about, you know, we, you know we, we have a certain amount of resources that we can manufacture and take on. And we're having problems in certain areas sourcing certain fabrics at different times. So we see that coming. So the whole idea is when we begin this discussion, we want to involve as many people as possible because that is coming our way. And, you know, that's, you did a beautiful job of summarizing what we're trying to do. So thank you for that. And one last, he's got one quick one. There we go. The young guy. Yeah, well, you, you can't do that. We vet all the factories that we use all over the world, and we've reduced the number of factories we use because we have a, a group that goes in. It's a quality control group. So before we even give them any products or to give them any business, they have to, we have to look at how they operate their business, how they pay their employees, how they house their employees if that's an issue, and then they have to sew up certain garments, and then we give them our bill of materials and said, okay, what is this going to look like when you sew it up? And then even when they start the production run, these people are sitting there when they're making the first garments, and they have to meet, they have to meet our quality. If they don't, they're stuck with it. It doesn't even leave the factory. So we have a very tight focus on maintaining our quality. That's a good question. Let's thank our speaker. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>